Well, good afternoon. I'm Peter Kirby, the Director of Congregational Services for the Missouri District of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And I welcome you today to our webinar. We're welcoming uh, Dr. Pete and Deb Jerkin uh, to present on the big goal, how to nurture lifelong learners of God's truth. Um, they live in Imperial, Missouri with their five children. Uh, Deb is a rostered LCMS teacher and has experience in teaching the faith in a variety of contexts. And Dr. Pete Jerkin is a pastor who is serving a call as an editor at Concordia Publishing House. But besides writing and developing resources for the church, he also teaches classes on teaching the faith at Concordia Seminary here in St. Louis and presents on a variety of topics related to lifelong faith formation. So we welcome them to present on this topic of the big goal. Okay. Uh, thanks, Peter. Yeah, uh, thanks for having us. Absolutely. <laughs> now I got to see if I can get this working. All right, screen share. Oh, the share button. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, like Peter said, uh, it's a it's a real pleasure uh, to to be here sharing on this topic, the big goal: how to nurture lifelong learners of God's truth, and to do it together. Um, I tend to write on fairly heady hypothetical things. Uh -huh. And you bring it down to earth. Uh -huh. And so we're both very interested in family ministry. And so together as we talk, um, not just big ideas, but what this actually means practically, yeah. uh, Deb is totally my thought partner and sounding board and all this. So hopefully these practical things will uh, be useful for you as well. Uh, like Peter said, uh, here's just a little bit about us. I, I'm Pete Jerkin. I'm my call is at Concordia Publishing House. Uh, as an editor of, of Bible resources, but curriculum resources and all sorts of other things. My doctorate's in adult learning theory. I have master's in curriculum development. Um, before coming to CPH, I was in the parish for eight years. I have a real love for family, lifelong adult uh, education and ministry. And so uh, it is a, a pleasure to serve and talk alongside this lovely lady. Yeah. So my main role is being a mom of five. That's what I primarily do in the home. Uh, I also teach art at my kids' Lutheran school two days a week. Um, I have a health and wellness business and I'm working on my family life masters um, from Concordia University, Wisconsin. So lots of things on our plate, but our really our passion is just nurturing the faith in the home. Yep. Speaking of lots of things on the plate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would you mind explaining this? So yeah, Pete found this picture and and then he asked me if I felt like I was the one pulling the cart. And I said, no, I think I feel like the cart itself being so overloaded. I think this is a really good picture of families today, just really loaded down. There's so much on our plate and we just have to keep moving. So that load versus capacity, what can we fit in our schedule? But then what really do we have the capacity for to actually take on and do well? And what we don't need to do in ministry is add one more thing onto people's plate. But how can we rather utilize the time that we have, come alongside families, members of our congregation to walk with them, use the time more intentionally for faith development? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're talking about uh, family ministry and how we run family ministries and help equip families for those vocations. Um, with this in mind, as parents who are in the midst of the throes of this sort of huge amount of capacity, even if we have more time, we just don't have much more capacity to, to uh, do the kinds of things that uh, we always we always want to do. Um, how do we approach this as congregations and institutions interested in family ministry? Well, in my experience, we tend to rely on uh, one or, or or both of these sorts of strategies. Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie. Here's me talking. See, this is Pete on with the book. This is a self-portrait <laughs> of my yes. husband. Yes, right now. Okay, so uh, educational theory behind understanding by design is we tend to fall into one of two categories when we're trying to teach something. Either it's coverage or activity. Um, in both cases, uh, the success of, of uh, what the activity is is what the the leaders do, what the teachers do. I think it's a tendency for us in our congregations, our congregational ministry, more thinking about 
family life education or family ministry to either we need to cover more material, right? So we need to have more classes where we talk about more stuff. We've got to pile on or uh, do activities, which is we got to have another activity where everyone's involved and adding more and more to an existing schedule. Now, I, these are fine things to do. It's okay to have programs where you have activities and it's okay to have programs where you cover content. I'm, I'm not saying that that's bad at all, but I'm saying that these are our two defaults we tend to focus on. And if we say, if we do these things, if we cover this parenting topic or we do this family ministry activity on top of everything else, then we're successful. But in, in this framework by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie, uh, what's often missed um, is the focus of well, what we should be focusing on, which is learning. Mm -hmm. instead of focusing on what we're going to do to add to people's already crazy, crazy, busy, hectic schedules and say, okay, we did this thing, check. We did that thing, check. We did that thing, check. Instead, I think what we should focus on primarily is what are people learning? What Absolutely. do they need to learn? How are we going to measure if any sort of meaningful learning has happened? But that leads us to this question, what should be the focus of our learning? Everyone's capacity is is pretty full, especially with our families. So if we had to focus on one thing, what would that thing or what should that thing be that we focus on learning? Oh, I love this. These selected verses from John 8 and John 15 talking about abiding, right? It's if we abide in the Lord. And I think the word abide is so personal. It's so tender. There's so much depth when you think about abiding. I think we all, you know, think of the hymn, Abide With Me. And so how can we sh have that load shared, right? Abiding in the Lord, walking with him on a daily basis. So that really is the simple focus. How can we help our members of our congregation abide with the Lord as they walk through their daily life? Yeah. And and to put this into to terms um, that might be a little more uh, reduced, Learning to abide in God's truth throughout life so that the spirit may continually grow us in Christ and we may bear good fruit. If we had to focus on one thing that would make all the rest of our programs uh, either easier or unnecessary in family life ministry, it'd be helping to equip people to abide in God's truth. And, and to reduce it down even further, this is our big goal. And that's going to be kind of what we're going to be talking about the rest of this presentation um, is the big goal of family ministry, the big goal of what we do in our congregations and dealing with our families is to help equip disciples for lifelong learning of God's truth. To equip disciples for lifelong learning of God's truth. What do we mean by equip? Yeah, I think we're really good in our congregations about getting resources into the hands of our members into the hands of people, but I think we miss the next step, which is opening up those resources and actually teaching them how to use it. Uh, modeling, open, opening them up, making sure the resources aren't just in their hands, but they're actually understand how to utilize them. So equipping is a modeling and a teaching and an ongoing process. Yeah. And many of the programs that we've seen in congregations and congregational or institutional ministry for, for families involve the handing off of a Bible or a resource. And I mean, and this is a critical first step. Absolutely. But how do we continue to use the time we have in our parishes, in our institutions, in our congregations uh, to help reinforce? So it's not just a thing where you get a thing, but this is our life together learning uh, how to use that thing and modeling how to use that thing. Yeah, and it isn't just a one-time thing. When we put it into their hands, we're, we're mo maybe there it's modeled then, but then we stop modeling it after it's in their hands. How do we continually engage and develop that? Yeah. Equipping, yeah. Yep. But like we've already kind of hinted at, this continues with what our, our challenge is, <laughs> going back to that first picture, whether or not uh, you're the person who is carrying the load or you feel like you're the cart, or you feel like the guy on the side who's watching the other person <laughs> carry the load, which is me sometimes yeah. as a dad. What's it, what's the challenge? Yeah, I think the challenge is just <laughs> with all these over, overburdened parents, how can we use the time? Like I said before, how can we use the time effectively? How can we not throw another huge you know, bag of grain on top of this cart? Um, 
but really just equip and help families in the midst of this, listen to their needs, come alongside and use the time that they have to re- relieve some of the burden rather than piling it on. Okay. Yeah. So that's the challenge. And that is a major challenge of uh, ministering to families right now. So let's think about, well, how we do that. So again, like I like I said, I like to think big strategies, big ideas, big hypothetical stuff. So I'll probably be talking for a little bit here. Uh, and then Deb's going to help bring it down to earth uh, practically uh, in, in a little bit. But we're both educators. Um, we like education. I teach education. You are a teacher. I educate. You educate. Uh, <laughs> we like teaching our kids. So um, that big goal, that big idea of equipping uh, disciples to be lifelong learners of God's truth, it is a simple idea. But simple is usually fairly difficult. Complex is easy. Adding another program, adding another thing, that's an easy thing to do. But that doesn't necessarily focus on on the the most important thing. So in order to take this simple idea and put it into uh, more manageable uh, strategies, more manageable goals, we've got to think like an educator. And let's break this down a little bit. And to get some actionable learning targets in our congregations and institutions in order to help equip uh, disciples to be lifelong learners of God's truth, right? So that, that's that's this kind of this next stage as we kind of break it down, still keeping that big central idea central, okay? Not focusing on just informing or doing or covering, but focusing on equipping, right? How can we use a framework that is both um, sequential yet flexible, that has a general progression <laughs> of A, B, C, and things we can work on, but is also flexible. It's not a program. That's not what we're saying. This is not a program that you got to follow this to the T, but something that is sequential, that has logic to it, but also is flexible. Um, But that can also be integrated into the life of the congregation and the home without just adding another program, without adding another thing to the schedule, without adding another expectation to parents. Like I said, like we both said, these things can be very good. And we found great benefits in programs and things. But the focus for this is not adding another program. Yeah building it into our life together. How are we equipping disciples to be lifelong learners of God's truth uh, together? Uh, the nice thing about this framework is I had an opportunity to help work on, on the basic idea behind this at Concordia Publishing House a number of years ago. Um, there was an initiative put together by uh, LCMS school ministry, a variety of school organizations, high schools and things, a handful of districts, Concordia Publishing House. We all got together and said, okay, what are some basic faith standards uh, that we can work on, some learning targets that we can work on together. This is all out there for free, lutheranschools.org. Uh, very pleased that this project we worked on is out there for free, lutheranschools.org. Uh, that has all sorts of very specific things that we built into the Enduring Faith uh, curriculum for schools, um, very specific things for different ages. We're not using those. For this presentation, we're using the basic framework put together for that to have more specific goals educationally that we can focus on uh, to help equip uh, people in our congregations uh, to be lifelong learners of God's truth. So check that out, lutheranschools.org. That has the whole meal deal. We're just going to be focusing on some uh, basics, some fundamentals. We're looking at mostly at that those bottom six things. So there's, these are six different categories, right? To take that simple goal equipping disciples to be lifelong learners of God's truth and bringing it down to six different categories, six different kinds of uh, understandings on one hand, and then like habits and behaviors on the other that we can uh, reinforce, equip in our congregations and institutions. So those bottom six there, biblical literacy, Lutheran doctrine, Christian heritage, dealing with the uh, understandings, okay, and skills, and then worship life, works of love, and confessing the faith, dealing more with like behaviors, Um, and different sorts of (laughs) habits that we can help reinforce. Uh, The neat thing about this, okay, and this is how we're using this framework right now, is that when you look at those those first three having to do with our our identity, who am I? A biblical literacy, Lutheran doctrine, and Christian heritage. uh, There is a basic sequence that is a logical sequence for learning. Okay, if we want to equip people to be lifelong learners of God's truth, you got to start by equipping them to actually know what's in the Bible. And we'll talk about this in detail, but that's kind of where it starts. 
We want them to be lifelong learners of God's truth. They got to know what's in the Bible. And then from that, they can learn what the Bible teaches. Okay, what are the big doctrines? And then from that, uh, they can, you know, in, in that sequence, then better understand how that, that truth, those teachings have been interpreted and taught throughout time, right? But the basic progression of how we learn and grow as lifelong learners of God's truth and our understandings. Um, and then the second set dealing with uh, why am I here? Christian calling, right? Uh, begins with understanding the, the habits and, and, the and the skills and the attitudes around how do I receive God's truth? Okay, that's worship life, developing those, those habits of receiving God's gifts. Uh, and then how do I receive and live God's truth? Kind of flows from that. And then finally, how do I receive, live, and confess God's truth, that confessing the faith, right? So these six categories, flexible, right? You can tackle them all at different times, but there is a general sequence if we want to help equip people to be lifelong learners of God's truth. These things build on each other. So let's look at some of them. I've talked a bit. Let's talk uh, practically uh, about what this might look like if we in our congregations are trying to use the time we have yeah. to help equip our families to be lifelong learners of God's truth. So starting with who am I, Christian identity, biblical literacy, what can we do on a congregational level in our churches to help equip people for biblical literacy? Well, I mean, biblical liter literacy is the foundation of everything, like you mentioned, and it really stems from not overcomplicating this, <laughs> but helping parents, individuals get into the daily habit of opening up their Bible and reading it. I think so often in congregations, we assume that there's a lot more biblical literacy than there is. When really most people only know the major overarching stories, you know, yeah, Ark and well, I, 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 a good example. Yeah, no, I was I was in a congregation with a very well-meaning elder uh, who came to me afterwards after worship one day and said, "Hey, Pastor, I'm kind of embarrassed to ask. Uh, was Jesus before or after the flood?" And was Jesus before or after the flood? I mean, this was this was a leader in the congregation. And it just struck me. I had assumed that people understood the basic narrative of scripture. I understood they knew if you say, you know, open up to John 3, 16, they'll know where to find it. But the more I dug in as a pastor, the more I realized we just assume people know these things. They understand the books of the Bible, how to navigate the Bible, how to interpret the Bible, right? And so as pastors, I'm a pastor, I'm guilty of this, I just dive right in and say, okay, let's talk about this big theme when... If we're not paying attention, we're looking out at the people. Uh, there's a lot of people who have no idea what you're talking about. So I think biblical literacy, if we want to focus on cultivating lifelong learners of God's truth, we got to start with understanding, A, that a lot of people don't know what's in the Bible. A lot of people don't know how to read the Bible. They don't know how to navigate the Bible. They're As adults, they're probably too scared to ask. And if we want, like you're talking about, people to be reading the Bibles in their homes, if we want them to be receiving the gifts of God's word, sometimes it's just going back to the basics and yeah. talking about this. One way we've done that is getting story Bibles into the hands of members of our congregation and the story Bible, not just being for the child. Now, here <laughs> yeah. you go, you know, third grader, here's a story Bible and you read it now. Instead, it's here's a story Bible. We're all going to read this together. And the parents are going to learn the stories and the kids are going to learn the stories and we're going to walk through it together. So that's one way, right? Going down really simply using a tool that we put into the hands of the kids, but really it's for the parents as well. Um, another thing is to model how, when we put, you know, the Bible into the hands of the adults, model how to read it. There's some great resources that we'll talk about at the end of this that can help with that, but actually modeling, okay, this is where we're going to open up. This is where the, this story from the children's Bible, this is where it is in scripture and then we're going to model reading through it this week mm -hmm. oh absolutely i mean so like uh if you have a children's message in your congregation um oftentimes i think we we can easily make the children's message into what kind of elaborate object lesson right where probably the most helpful thing would be open up a story bible sit with the kids read it model for the parents even 
talk about this. Hey, parents, this is how you read the Bible with your kids. You know, here's what's a picture. What do you see in the picture? The little kids can talk about that and read through the story and have some of the older ones kind of, uh, you know, talk about what they learned from that story, um, modeling for them instead of just saying, okay, you know, everyone, we all obviously know the story of Absalom, don't we? You know, no one knows the story of Absalom unless they're really well read in your congregations. Um, so model for it. Don't take anything for granted and teach the principles of biblical interpretation with the time you have. Talk about it in your sermons. Talk about it in your education hours. Uh, talk about these things. And instead of just informing them, equip them to use these skills. And letting the parents know that they're the most influential people in their children's lives. And having the kids catch the parents reading their scripture mm -hmm. is one of the best things that you can do. Oh, and, and vulnerability too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had another, another uh, guy in one of my parishes uh, come up to me. Um, he hadn't really been in Bible class, but he came up to me and he said, pastor, my kids in a Lutheran school, they know the Bible stories better than I do. I can't talk to my kid about this Bible story because I don't know it. Um, and just about then and there, we made the decision in our church that for our Bible class education hour, we were just going to do the same Sunday school stories the kids were. Absolutely. And in that case, I mean, all of a sudden our education hour Bible study tripled because we all of a sudden we had all these parents that were afraid to ask and they didn't know, but if they could learn alongside the kids and, and they the could kids be, ask questions, then they knew what the answer is. And they yeah. could be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Um, but that was a shift from me and my ministry thinking about equipping rather than just informing, which was which was so huge. And that was using the time we had. It wasn't another program. It was just using the sun, uh, Bible study, using children's message, talking about it in the sermons, talking about it in our life together, putting it in the bulletins, and really raising that. Okay, we want you to be able to read the Bible. We want you to know how to do it. I want you to be able to do it at home too. Absolutely. All right. Okay, so biblical literacy foundational for our identity and the basic knowledge and skill. Uh, <laughs> moving on to Lutheran doctrine. Now, when we say Lutheran doctrine, according to this framework, I mean, there's all sorts of Lutheran doctrine. In, in this framework, we're talking mostly about the ideas in the catechism, okay? Those things laid out by, you know, the, the six chief parts, uh, these things that are so important for us to know, taken from scripture, um, kind of codified and put into uh, categories, right? So how do we reinforce Lutheran doctrine in our congregations and our institutions without just adding more stuff for people to do? Yeah. Um, I would say that if we're going to think about the catechism, a great place to start is to stop thinking of it as just something kids do during confirmation but something that is taught and reinforced throughout the lifespan, but not just talking about it. So I've had a lot of pastors I've seen, I've done this myself, talking from the pulpit. Okay, people read the catechism at home. You really got to do this, laying the law down hard. When honestly, a lot of the people in my parishes, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They get a hit of it during the confirmation years and then you know, people wash their hands of it and say, that was a lot of work. I'm never touching this again, yeah. even if they even did that. So if we want to reinforce Lutheran doctrine, if we want to reinforce the catechism, these catechetical ideas, just like with biblical literacy, we got to talk about it throughout everything that we do. And really, that's what it was intended for, was youth right. in the home for the head of the household to equip their families in faith. Yep. And so like getting the 2017 edition of the small catechism, which is a great resource. I worked on it. So I, I I know it, uh, but I really get the sense that that was meant, designed for adults and helping them answer the questions of their kids and not just a textbook for junior hires. So build it in, do a weekly catechetical idea, go through uh, uh, a, you know, a commandment or an article in at, at the beginning or the end of the worship service, reinforce these things. Uh, with the time that you have so that when kids get to confirmation, this isn't the first time they've seen it. And when they leave confirmation, this is part of our life together and they can take these things with them. And the conversation of faith in the home is just becomes a habit and becomes part of life. It isn't something extra we're doing, but it's something that's integrated into everything we do. So when we're eating dinner, some of these things come up. When we're out doing sports activities, some of these things come up in the car. It's just integrated into what Yep. The life of a believer. Yep. And as we do memory work. Oh, yeah. I like to wrap the memory work or make like 
you know, act it out or make songs. And then the whole family, you know, starts dancing along. And well, you can't, you can't help it because they're quite memorable. But yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to, should I do an example? No, okay. <laughs> no. but, but finding ways that if you're doing memory work, how do you, how do you do it together? Right? And not just something you, you put all this extra expectation on junior hires and their parents when junior hires and the parents are already so loaded down. They are no longer the guy pushing the cart. They are the cart. Yeah. And you can ultimately unintentionally create an environment where once they're done with all these weighty expectations, they're never going to want to do anything ever again. Right. So how do we, instead of adding more, build it into the life we have mm -hmm. together. All right. Uh, which leads us to the, the third part here of this framework at uh, Christian heritage. Um, just what's in the Bible? What does the Bible teach? How has this been understood throughout time? Um, a couple things uh, to note about Christian heritage. This is important. This is something that we uh, do in our Lutheran church. We focus on a lot. This is great. Um, I would say as we're thinking about equipping disciples to be lifelong learners of God's truth, whenever we talk about Christian heritage, our Lutheran identity, talking about denominations, talking about these things, it's good to remember uh, that we got to focus on biblical literacy and doctrine and then focus on Christian heritage, mm -hmm. right? That we look at our Christian heritage, our Lutheran heritage, denominations through the lens of doctrine and, and scripture, um, and not just as this way to kind of combat that we're, we're right, they're wrong, that kind of thing, to give a false impression about what's actually going on here. So keep that in mind. This is our Christian heritage and history is very important. How people have interpreted scripture throughout time is, is super important. Um, but let's not focus on that to the neglect of biblical literacy and the doctrines, which are the important part there. Um, and, and, and number two, other thing uh, to think about this um, is we do have a lot of resources at Concordia Publishing House um, that are simple ways to help understand our Christian heritage. So a biblical explanation uh, of uh, church history or simple explanation of Christian er, church history, simple explanation of Christian denominations. These are real simple pamphlets and things that you can have. And so if you talk about, hey, look, this is uh, this time of the year, we're talking about our Lutheran heritage. Look, we have a resource for you to take on your way out that you can read at home and you can have as a reference to understand the difference between Christian denominations. That's a way to reinforce that um, without adding to the confusion. Yeah. So there you go. Those are the first three. Keep moving. Uh, the, the the second three uh, categories here. Uh, why am I here dealing with Christian calling, right? So just as the first set with Christian identity begins with biblical literacy, the first set here, kind of the foundation for equipping people to be lifelong learners of God's truth is worship life. Yeah. How to receive the gifts of God's word. Okay. I guess it's my turn. Okay. So <laughs> See, I get rolling and it's, uh, I can't stop. Okay, go. Life really has two parts. Number one is going to be on Sunday mornings. And how are we helping people, helping come alongside members of our congregation and make Sunday mornings easier and a more connected um, experience? So families who are coming in, do, do they have other people they know that are of different ages in the congregation? Do you have um, older members of your congregation? Maybe you could, they could sit with families. Maybe we could connect. Um, and I know I would have loved to have um, a grandma figure in the pew when Pete was up leading service and I was in the pew with all my kids and they were wanting to run out. I would have loved to have other people help in the pew on Sunday mornings or honestly even know more than just a few people's names in the congregation. I think so often we rush into church, we're so busy, we sit in the same pew, we don't really know who's around us, and we look over and we smile, but we don't take the next step to really connect um, with the people around us a lot. Yeah, well, and, and families, we think about family and family life, these people who are already so overburdened and overloaded. Having relationships with people, having more relationships with people, people who care, who notice when they're not there, who notice if they could use a hand and actually will help out, can help alleviate that burden. Um, and want them to come back. Yes. Having yes. a point of connection with people, that's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. So that Sunday morning worship life, and then how do you bring it home on a daily basis? Um. Uh, so some things we do in our family around this would be 
being in daily prayer together. Now, a lot of times that can look like, how do you get into the habit of prayers, right? A lot of times people attach prayers to mealtimes or before bed. I encourage you to think at least one or two other times in your day where maybe you're with your kids. For us, it's when we're pulling out of the driveway and I'm taking the kids to school or we're all pulling out of the driveway, going to an event or something, we're all in the car. I have everyone's rapt attention and someone in the car, I'll say, okay, it's time to pray. Or if I forget, one of the kids will say, oh, who's going to pray as we're, as we're pulling out. So getting into a habit of prayer and thinking about identifying other times in your day that you can add that in. Uh, another one is after mealtime at for us, that's after dinner, um, shove a treat in their hand. A lot of times we like to light a candle and then we incorporate that biblical literacy. We'll read a Bible story. We'll sing a hymn, a song. Um, we'll talk about it. We'll pray together. By the time their treat's done, our, you know, our little family time is over, but right. it's daily habits. Oh, well, and building into the, the our daily routines as well. So building into, we try to eat dinner once a day. We don't, we're not always, at, you know, going to bed at the same time. So yeah. having a family prayer time isn't always something that we can do at the very end of the day, but we found that building it into our daily routine is, is good and important. And when you're talking from the front, uh, when you're leading, when you're as a pastor or ministry leader in your congregation, um, don't just assume that people know how to do this. It's easy to say, okay, you know, do go home and do your prayers, do devotions. A lot of people don't even know what a devotion is, um, and they have no idea why it's important. I mean, that's just the reality we live in. So even something as simple as people from the front saying, look, what is, what is a devotion? It could be just reading a Bible story with your kids. Well, guess what? Find a time you have. Talk about at the dinner table. Talk about praying in the car. And don't just say pray, <laughs> actually show and model and talk about these things. Yeah, and write it up in your bulletin, have a page in your bulletin on how we're going to take the faith home this week. And we're all going to do this together. In the announcements, have someone in the announcements stand up and share two minutes of what they've done to incorporate it into their life. Mm -hmm. We got to talk about this, right? And not assume, right? Not assume that people know, right? Okay. So, so much we could talk about with worship right. life, but we're going to keep going uh, for the sake of, of time here. Um, but think about how you can use the time you have to help reinforce that. Uh, works of love. So after we receive the gifts of God's word, how do we then uh, live uh, God's word in, in our daily lives? How do we live out our roles and responsibilities? It kind of flows from that, the life of faith. So how do we use the time we have in our congregations to help build up people in Christian character and vocations? Yeah, I think, again, what is the time that you have together on a Sunday morning? Not adding something new for, I love the little coffee greeting time between after service, maybe before education hour. A lot of times that is not, that time isn't used super intentionally. No. How can we use that little bit of time to create more intentional relationships between members of our congregation. Maybe we're putting up a slideshow of the members of the congregations with their names on it. So we know maybe we're highlighting a few families each week and having them say their names and something they like to do. Some point of connection, having people get outside of their busy, crazy life and look somebody in the eye, listen to a need and connect. Right. So those simple connections, not adding a new thing on, but being more intentional with our time about fostering those relationships. Right. And you, you learn to live out your vocation in community as you see people of different ages and stages in, in their different uh, life responsibilities. So that is that is super key. And all the research shows that if kids have meaningful relationships with adults before they uh, leave the, the house, they are much more likely to come back to the congregation. So on top of that, using the time we have, um, I would highly encourage you guys to think about how you can do occasional intergenerational things during the education hour, right? How can you get everyone together to sing a silly song or do a story or do uh, some sort of craft together with the time you already have for that education hour instead of Sunday school and Bible class and help build some of those relationships? Because that's where you learn service in the congregation and where you kind of are, are encouraged to, to build those connections with people uh, that can then spill out into all sorts of responsibilities in life, right? 
So uh, works of love. Uh, final one here, uh, confessing the faith. So receive the gifts of God's word, live it out, and now confess God's truth to the world. That's what a lifelong learner of God's truth does, is someone who is able to uh, continually learn and grow in what it means to confess the faith. So how do we use the time we have? Yeah, and I think one way we can do this is highlighting the ministries of the church, the missionaries that the church is supporting, but really, instead of just saying, this is the missionary, actually go a little deeper. Okay, does does that missionary, do they have a family? Tell us about your kids. What do the kids like to do? Can our kids write letters to the missionary's family? Can we Zoom with them? Can we bring them in, even if it's via Zoom or webinar, and actually have an intergenerational event and all learn about the mission of the church together. Right. So it's it's easy for us uh, to have in our, our congregation this, you know, missions and ministries and special service things are kind of a thing that some people do and other people don't. Um, so how do we bring that in? How do we highlight that? How do we talk about that with the time we have in, in our announcements and model and share what this looks like and get kids excited? M many missionaries I know, many missionaries I know, would be over the moon if they were asked to zoom in with a Sunday school class or even a family and spend 15 minutes talking about their life out in the mission field to build that connection even with a family. Right? We don't want to overburden the missionaries, but so many of them are eager to talk and share and they would love a letter from kids. And we don't have to add an extra program to do that. It can just be a thing that we do that will help them understand the importance of Christian witness and get that built up within the family, within the household from early on. I feel like we're going to have longer bulletins now. We're going to add a page for, this is how you're going to bring the faith home this week. Here's a missionary we're highlighting. Here you, here's where you can contact them. So longer bulletins with more connection. <laughs> Less programs, I guess. I, I guess. Well, <laughs> and if you if you put this stuff in the bulletins, and I, and I mean this, you don't want communication overload. Yeah. But the point we're trying to get to is... If, if you have this information, how do we how do we go beyond just adding more yeah. and to highlight the important things that are right in front of us that help equip us for lifelong learning of God's truth? So talk about it, highlight it, and work on equipping people with those ideas, those understandings, those habits um, that will help form faith uh, for life. And one of my favorite things that I'm going to interject, one of my favorite things that you did in a, in a service when you were a pastor many years ago was you had the people who are sitting in their normal pews actually turn around and tell each other their names and introduce themselves. Right. A young, a young pastor. I didn't know what I was doing. Part, it's part of my, we still part, don't know what we're doing. We're just, it's part of my sermon. I know some people say this is the worst thing to do, but at the time, this is just what I did. I had them turn to someone uh, and just talk for a minute, introduce yourselves. Um, it, and share during the sermon, which I mean, not, it's probably bad sermon policy. But but here's what here's what happened. Uh, a lady came to me afterwards and said, "I've been sitting in the same spot for 19 years. The person behind me was sitting in the same spot for 19 years. I didn't know her name. She didn't know mine. It's the first time we've ever talked. 19 years. And this was a ministry leader. So I guess a part of this is just assume assume that your people are less connected than you think. Assume people are less biblically literate than you think. Assume people do not understand the uh, habits of devotional life and prayer As generally assume that most of them don't have that framework. Um, they're too scared to ask, but if you build this into what you already have and help equip them, uh, they will be better off for it and they'll be better you know, trained and nurtured in being lifelong learners of God's truth. And if you find that people are very well versed in this, you can highlight them and help them share and equip other members of the congregation yep. as well. Absolutely. And have them share what they know and what Absolutely. they've done. Um, okay, so uh, sample resources, just have a few of them up here, which are uh, ones, they're Concordia Publishing House, I'm a fan, I've worked on a number of these, um, but I don't just work on these, I actually use these in my own life and I encourage them in, in the congregation that I've, I, I serve in, um, so I, I, I believe in these things. So like uh, Deb was saying, um, like there are things like 120 Bible stories, Concordia's Bible history, the story Bible that you want to get in the hands of your families, um, but not just give it to them, but actually like reinforce and talk about and model how you use it with the time you have and help encourage them to before bed because you need to read to your kids. Why not read a Bible story book, uh, you know, after dinner, 
uh, in the morning, sometime during your routine, build that in. That will be exponentially great for your people's understanding of the Bible, but not just the kids, the adults as well. There's things like Luther's small catechism for kids um, and other kind of basic uh, catechesis materials beyond, uh, you know, because the, the explanation of the catechism is, is pretty deep. But there's some real good introductory materials that you can use, uh, again, as part of your devotions, as part of your life together. Um, there's the Simple Explanation series uh, that has all sorts of little pamphlets and things, especially with things like specific doctrines and uh, church year and church history and things that you can get into the hands of your people and say, like, you don't know about denominations. Here's a great trustworthy resource that you can have and you can bring home. Right. And I love, I'm going to give a shameless plug to the Lutheran Reader's Bible, which is uh, a resource that you put together. And I've been working through it and it has reading plans. And also at the beginning of each book of the Bible, it highlights the overarching story, important um, verses to help you really understand and breaks it down for a lot of, and just improving biblical literacy for people who opening scripture may just be a scary thing. So I highly suggest that Lutheran Reader's Bible. Yep. Well, thanks. Get it into their hands, equip them. That's the first part, but then model talk about, and yeah. don't just leave it there as here's, here's a thing actually show them how to use it and reinforce continually over and over again. That's what a lifelong learner does. Yeah, so I think as much as we can simplify what we do in a congregation, simplify it, not assume knowledge, um, and then help people connect with one another, foster opportunities for connection. Um, the more we can have people looking each other in the eye, listening to needs, walking alongside, the stronger those bonds and connections we're going to be in. We can support and encourage one another. Yeah, and that's, that's such a huge part of uh, equipping people, especially with adults, is, you know, how do you get them sharing what works with each other, sharing their burdens with each other, learning how to pray for each other within the community. Um, and all too often, you know, we just kind of say, well, we're here to give you information. You go your own way um, without ever connecting them. And so well, this lifelong learning of God's truth is only ever reinforced as people are better connected to one another, sharing with, with the one body another. of Christ yeah. and being the body of Christ. So that's, that's huge. Um, yeah. I kind of leave with this thought, why we focus on uh, the big goal. Um, uh, I've been teaching for the last three years, I've been teaching different classes for the seminary, I'm speaking at different places. There's an awful lot of confusion out there about what we should do, what we should focus on. And that can unintentionally lead to a whole lot of complexity where we just make more expectations and keep on adding more and more and more onto the lives of people that are already generally overburdened. And that can lead to burnout or uh, disconnect. By focusing on the simple goal and these simple ways to use the time that we have to help foster lifelong learning of God's truth, um, we'll know how to lead people. We'll know where to go and, uh, and we'll help them get there as well. And that's my hope for you uh, and my encouragement with this uh, webinar. Uh, that uh, you uh, have some ideas and some thoughts about how to uh, help get that goal rolling in your own context. Um, yeah, finally, uh, there's our, our uh, contact information. If you have questions for either one of us, um, please reach out, right? We're, we're doing this. I'm doing this as someone who loves family ministry. You're doing this as someone who loves family ministry uh, for the district. Um, it's a great honor to, to be able to talk about this and we'll keep these ideas going. Absolutely. Thank you again for giving us the time to present.